Well, going forward, I think we'll continue to have this sort of difference of opinion and this sort of distant relationship between not just simply the Lieutenant Governor and the Speaker, but between the two chambers themselves and each other. And so there's going to have to be some mending of um, the relationships between the Republicans in the pink building. How quickly does that have to happen? Because as you know, Governor Greg Abbott just said this week that there's going to be another special session starting next month. School choice is going to come up. And that obviously is a very controversial decision in the House. And so how quickly do those fences need to be mended? And if they aren't, what impact could that have? Well, the fences need to be mended quickly, but those things generally don't happen quickly. And the fact that we will have at least one and perhaps several special sessions only creates opportunities for there to be more opportunities for there to be strong differences of opinion between the two chambers. And so I don't expect this to happen anytime soon. And so what does that mean for Governor Greg Abbott? Because he's pushing hard to get school choice passed. Well, I, I think for, for the governor, he has to develop relationships himself between members of both chambers in order to be successful in getting the legislation that he's interested in passed. And so the difference of opinion or the difference of, in terms of the relationship between Republicans in the House and Republicans in the Senate, that makes his work a little harder, no doubt, because he's got to work with both of them so that he can get a majority of both chambers to vote for his legislation. It increases his workload for sure. So what has to happen for fences to be mended? <laughs> well, I think, as, as I've said before, a grown-up has to appear, and probably at least two grown-ups. And they have to be members. It's not the governor. It has to be a member of the House or a Republican member of the Senate that comes to comes to their respective colleagues and says, guys, gals, this isn't good for Texas. We're not, we're not being responsible in fully doing the business of Texans. And let's get away from all of the he said, she said, and let's get away from all the friction and let's just simply focus on the work of Texas. But that has to be a grown up. And that grown up will understand that he or she is putting their own career at risk. Because the first person who says to their colleagues, we're not doing the business of the people of Texas, and we need to put aside these differences, is not going to be well received. That's why they said, I said there needs to be at least two grown ups, because it's going to be the second one that has to close the deal. And why don't you believe Governor Abbott should be touching that? He's not a member. This is a fight between the members. In this particular fight, he's an outsider. Now, he can arbitrate, he can mediate, but this is a fight between Republicans in the House and Republicans in the Senate. He's neither. He can arbitrate, he can mediate, he can call them together, but it has to be the two chambers who say we have to quit fighting each other. And there's also a dispute between Republicans in the House because you had those members who imp uh, voted to impeach Attorney General Ken Paxton and those who opposed doing that. And uh, my question now is, do you think that Speaker Phelan is in trouble? Because during a special session, there may be some House Republican who calls a vote for the chair, right? To try to... And, and you can, you can at any time. I mean, obviously we saw Representative Steve Toth, a uh, member of the House, decide to resign from the Texas House Freedom Caucus over the impeachment issue. And you're right, there were 20 members, Republican members of the Texas House, who have now called for an apology from Speaker Phelan and for his resignation. There is no doubt that he's at risk. And we'll see if in the course of the time between now and the special session beginning and during it, whether he can keep his troops together such that he can remain his speaker. You know, the interesting thing is in terms of the 20 who have called for his resignation, it will be interesting to see if they can 
find enough support outside of their group of 20 to be able to overtake and overthrow the speaker, I tend to doubt that because that would mean they'd have to be, you know, creating a, a coalition of people who actually wanted, who wanted to impeach uh, the speaker, I mean, to impeach the attorney general. So that doesn't seem quite likely. And one of the things, I don't know if you had a chance to watch uh, Ken Paxton's interview with Tucker Carlson last night, but one of the things that he said was he, he talked about the fact that in the Texas House, he, he blamed the Biden administration, he blamed Texas Democrats for causing all this and, and having an impact on Speaker Dade Phelan. And so my question is, they were discussing about the fact that the House, there are Democratic chairs of committees, et cetera. There's been a lot of internal friction within the House GOP as to and the Texas GOP itself about whether Republicans should be the only ones to chair committees and whether Republicans should be the only ones to actually vote on a speaker instead of having Democrats. And so I'm wondering, do you think that this will reignite all of this and perhaps lead to a change this time around? You know, it has been the custom and the history of the Texas House that chairs came from both parties, no matter who the speaker was. The speaker could have been a Democrat, the speaker could have been a Republican. I don't foresee that changing uh, anytime soon. And I did not see uh, the attorney general's interview last night, but I have read news accounts about it. But I don't see, I don't see that changing. And talk to me a little bit about the, the broader disruption that this impeachment has caused within the Republican Party of Texas. Would you would you describe this as a civil war in the Republican Party? <laughs> well, Jack, I said when President Trump got the nomination in 2016, and I definitely said when he got the nomination in 2020, that whether he won and re, 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 was returned to the White House or whether he lost and became a private citizen, we, as Republicans were going to go through a civil war. And we're in the midst of a civil war today. We're in the midst of a civil war to determine the soul and direction of this party. It may not be the principles of Ronald Reagan as we go forward. It may be something else, but we're fighting about what that something else is. And there's no doubt. I mean, you see it in terms of just here in Texas. You see it in terms of the fight within the Texas House among Republicans. You see it among the fight between the Senate and its co-chamber, the Texas House. We are in a civil war right now. And, and there's nothing wrong about that. You know, you know, Clemens made the comment in The Godfather when they were talking about going to the matches. You gotta do this every 10 years or so. That's all right, ain't no big deal. How do you see this shaking out? Well, I wish I had that talent. I don't have the talent to do that kind of prognostication. Um, it will be ugly -er before it gets better. Um, what side wins, I don't know. Um, and the longer it takes for a grown up to enter the room, the uglier you're gonna be. So let me ask you a couple of quest other questions. Uh, first, where do you see this uh, school choice vote going? Do you think that will pass? I think, I think it's still tough. I think it's tough for rural Republicans. And I think it's tough because we still sell, you know, I made my first speech about school choice in 1989, in favor of school choice, 1989. I wrote my first commentary in 1990. We still talk about school choice as if we're moving a youngster from Thomas Jefferson High School to St. Thomas Aquinas High School. They're moving from one building to another. And I think one way to attract rural Republicans would be to provide many vouchers so that moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas can find a way to get learning brought to their youngster. I mean, no disrespect to the former governor's hometown of Paint Creek, but you're not gonna get a master math teacher or science teacher to move to Paint Creek. 
and you're probably not going to teach Mandarin Chinese in Paint Creek. But if a mom or dad could get accelerated math and science learning off the internet from a teacher at the University of Texas, or they could buy language services from Babbel or um, one, of the, one of the other language providers, then maybe you could get rural Texans interested because there's a way for them to gain something. As it stands now, in terms of the, the proposed legislation, that's gonna to be tough. And so I don't think we've properly incentivized them to want to vote for school choice. I did wanna ask you about one other comment that uh, Paxton made last night in, in, in his interview with Tucker Carlson, and that was he went after Senator John Cornyn and said, somebody needs to challenge him uh, when he's up for reelection in 2026. And uh, Carlson at one point asked him, well, why don't you do it? And he said, everything is on the table. What do you make of that potential scenario of a primary challenge between Senator Cornyn and the AG? Number one, I take the AG at his word. Everything is on the table. And number two, that would be a very, very interesting um, primary because Senator Cornyn has not had a legitimate populist opponent from his right hip. And this would be one on his right hip. This would be somebody who comes with um, a significant part of the, of the Republican primary voting strength in his pocket. So that would be an interesting challenge for the number two ranking senator in the United States Senate. I did want to ask you to put on your former Texas Education <laughs> Agency commissioner hat for a second. There are a number of school districts in our area, and I guess across the state, who are suing the Texas Education Agency over two things, Robin Hood and also the changes that are being made through the uh, A through F account, uh, accountability system, the letter grading that uh, the, the state uh, provides for school districts and their progress. Uh, and so I'm wondering, what do you make of those? I would say to school officials, good luck with that. Um, Why? You know, the TEA lawyers deal with these very, very same issues 24-7, 365. District lawyers deal with these issues maybe once a decade. I was sued probably 30 some times when I was commissioner. At the end of the day, never lost a one. You always lose in state district court in Travis County, then you appeal it up to the Court of Appeals. And if necessary, you appeal it to the Texas Supreme Court. At the end of the day, you win. In this particular matter, um, when I was commissioner, you did the review annually. And now the legislature, I think in 2017, said that the commissioner has to make his review every five years. And this happens to have been the fifth year. And the argument that you could progress and still have a lower grade because you didn't meet, meet the cut score ranking, um, that happens you can see where that happens all the time. So I don't see a lot of success coming from the A through F of lawsuit. I know it's troublesome for superintendents and principals and perhaps even moms and dads, uh, even the kids themselves. But I don't see a lot of success coming from that lawsuit. And what about Robin Hood, the challenges to Robin Hood? I have a great deal of empathy for high property value districts having to take their dollars and send some of their dollars to Austin so that it can support a low property value district elsewhere. And when you think of many of the high property value districts, they're enjoying increased enrollment, but some of the youngsters or many of the youngsters that are coming to their, adding to the enrollment, are youngsters from 
that need more instruction, they need more support. So those districts, while they may be high property value districts, they need those dollars to educate their own kids. What I do, and so I understand that and I appreciate that. What I do not understand and what I cannot get behind is the district unilaterally, as some of these districts have suggested they would do, unilaterally making the decision not to send the money to Austin. If this is their way of sort of waving to the members of the legislature that you need to hurry up and fix this, I'm fine with that because I think they do need to hurry up and fix it. But to unilaterally not send dollars to the state to assist and benefit a low property value district, I think is inappropriate. What you're gonna do is put the commissioner in a position where he has to basically artificially take property out of your district and assign it to another district. At the end of the day, you're not gonna win that one. The legislature has to fix this. And you know, one of the things last night in the interview that Paxton had with Tucker Carlson is he actually brought Robin Hood up and he blamed mm -hmm. this on former, former governor, George W. Bush and Senator Cornyn as the former attorney general. What do you make of that? Well, in time wise, that's when it came. That, that's when it occurred, of course. Um, but the world has changed quite a bit since uh, Robin Hood went into effect. You know, there are a lot of things that we do from a policy perspective that made ample sense at the time. And over time, we have new facts and we have new or additional uh, sort of features to the, that legislation and you need to revisit it. And so I'm not going to blame Senator Cornyn or the former governor, Governor Bush, for what we have now. What I would do is to call upon the current leaders to fix it. Michael Williams, former Texas Education Agency Commissioner, former Railroad Commissioner. Thank you so much. We always appreciate talking with you. My pleasure, Jack. Good to be here. Good to be with you.